Nancy Watrous is the founder and executive director of the Chicago Film Archives, established in 2003 to preserve initially several thousand 16 millimeter films that had been held by the Chicago Public Library. That mission soon expanded and was helped along a bit by several awards from our preservation assistance grants for smaller institutions program. In fact, I first met Nancy at an archivist conference in 2010 where we served together uh, in a session devoted to that funding program. Those grants, however, were tr truly outdone by the uh, wonderful honor bestowed upon the Chicago Film Archives early this year when it received a MacArthur Foundation Award for Creative and Effective Institutions. Uh, quite an affirmation of your work, uh, I'd say. On the website for the Chicago Film Archives is a marvelous uh, little introductory video that closes with a simple line that I just love. What has been illuminates what will be. Likewise, Nancy, I think we can safely say that your dedicated work has been a beacon of light to so many in the audiovisual heritage community. Uh, please join me in welcoming Nancy Watchers. Well, you brilliant people, I kind of feel like a fraud. <laughs> but I always feel like a fraud when we got our house the first year I was a mom. <laughs> but, um, whoops, let me get my glasses. A major thank you to the NEH um, for this invitation to speak. Um, this invite is warmly received as recognition of the many independent and smaller organizations out there who are a critical part of our national system of AV preservation. A system that includes the Library of Congress, our universities, our museums, our libraries, and also includes Northeast Historic Film, Experimental Sound Studio, Texas Archives of the Moving Image, Apple Shop, Media Burn, Mid-Atlantic Region of Moving Image Archives, Anthology Films, Oddball Films, the Alaska Moving Image Preservation Association, and the Chicago Film Archives. I'm going to do a Trump. Um, but I do love this field. I came into it late, working in the film production most of my life. Then I stumbled onto the Chicago Public Library's film collection that was becoming orphaned. Here was a family of several thousand films that were carefully chosen by the library over several decades, and they needed a home. I discovered a deep interest I didn't know I had, regional histories, the film medium, and their intersection. I also discovered pretty quickly how much I love the people in this field. I suspect that there's something that we all have in common, which is this kind of wild, sometimes chaotic engagement with the world and with ourselves that can only really be simmered down with archiving and numbering and cataloging. More than 10 years ago, Charles Tupperman, Michelle Pitts, Andy Urich, Carolyn Faber, Jackie Stewart, Bill O'Farrell, and Rick Pralinger, not all necessarily at the same time, sat around my dining room table to figure out how an independent regional archive might work in Chicago. Bill O'Farrell commented, put your shingle up and the collections will roll in. And at that time and place, that was kind of counterintuitive. But as we know, Bill was brilliant and they did begin to march in the door. Home movies, industrial films, documentaries, and amateur films. Some film don donors wanted to work with us, actually help CFA get started. Others just wanted to talk about their films. They wanted to share their histories. They just kind of wanted to talk. StoryCorps, of course, is based upon this human impulse. It became clear in a very organic way that first and foremost, CFA would be serving the public, listening, digesting, and acknowledging. It was the public that slowly began to cement CFA's identity. 
we indeed became a regional archive when the first filmmakers walked in the door with their films. When I sat in the Barrelzheimer's living room, chatting for a couple hours, before hauling away their home movies, their projectors, and their stories. CFA's first walk-in happened at my house where our office was set up with transfer equipment. Without any prior notice, a Serbian man and his son drove up to my house and knocked on my door. He brought in a bag of eight millimeter home movies and placed them on our dining room table. He then pulled out his wallet that was bulging with bills. I liked what was unfolding. Ready to go, we brought the films up to my second floor where I had the office and began transferring reels that recorded the death of an elder in the old country. We saw a casket propped outside the door of a one room house in some rural area in Montenegro. Inside, a man lay on his deathbed. He just lay there. Then the camera slowly panned around to grieving women who were seated in profound sadness just watching him die. In spite of the content of these films, this was such a victory for CFA, that walk-in. No phone call, no email, just a guy with a bag of home movies and a wad of bills knocking on my door. One Saturday, another client came to my house to supervise a rush transfer and edit of her home movies. A family member had died, and they were going to loop the home movies during the funeral. She wanted every single image of her ex-husband removed from the films. <laughs> we did finally get an office in the same building that housed our films. Films continued to traipse in with their owners. One day, a particularly interesting collection of home movies arrived at our office, and shortly after, our building management called to tell us our client had pooped in the stairwell. Could we clean it up, please? He was an old gentleman who had traveled across the states to make sure his home, his home movies were safely housed at CFA. We performed the requested housekeeping. It was worth it. Another time, a pair of siblings used the CFA offices to stage a major family feud. On a Friday, the sister brought in the family's home movies with her mom and insisted that the paperwork be completed that day. Both she and the mom signed and went home. The next Monday morning, the sister frantically called to warn us that her brother was on his way over to CFA and we should call the police. He wanted the home movies back. Don't give them to him. He did arrive with his mom, angry and threatening to sue CFA, calling his lawyer while the mom is clearly exasperated, afraid, and unsuccessfully trying to calm her one grown child in the room and the other on the phone. Meanwhile, our attorney is pouring over the agreement he created only a few days before and tells us if the mom wants him back, she can break the agreement, give him back. So we load the films onto a cart to bring out to the son's car. He's loading them up in his van while the mom sits in our office with the young Anne. It's quiet and awkward, and she turns to Anne and says kind of sadly, never, ever have children. <laughs> she leaves CFA for our, a check for our troubles and drives away with the son. After they're gone, our attorney informs us there's actually a federal law named after this guy who had just left our office. This is the humanities. It's reflected in the films. It's also reflected in the people we meet who bring context to these materials. And during these exchanges, we, the archivists, too, become part of that context, a part of our region, an informed part of our community. The independent regional archive is a beast with its own character and ruled by its own particular nature. It's messy, unpredictable, loving, possibly litigious, heartbreaking, funny, and sometimes a scary beast. As archivists from small independents will tell you, we are uninsulated from our dynamic and unruly world. There are few barriers to the public and fewer barriers to the financial challenges we meet every day. These two truths live in the DNA of staffers who work these archives. I can also say with confidence 
that these two realities give birth to our strengths. These two defining intrinsic realities require staff to be internally communicative, internally codependent, and internally generous with our knowledge and with each other. Consistent messaging among the staff becomes a hallmark trait. Our organizational charts are circles that overlap. They're Venn diagrams. At the same time, our smallness, our autonomy, and our proximity to our own financial vul vulnerabilities force us to be strategic, efficient, and to perpetually practice ingenuity. It also forces us to be kind. If we make mistakes, we do it with little regret because we're capable of changing course quickly. But above all, in the context of regional archives, access does not only pertain to the materials we preserve, access pertains to us. We are accessible to the public, our own selves. As we take those phone calls, those walk-ins, and ingest the filmmaker stories into our own understanding, our own intellectual organization of our region, our own knowledge of the media makers in our communities, to hopefully create an organizational expression that is always in development, always purposeful, and embodies rich and meaningful and close to the truth context. This year, the media artist Melika Bass created a new work from selected CFA footage. And as she explained it, her new work was an acknowledgement of the different levels of curatorial decisions that went before her while creating her piece. As Yvonne says, the practice of curation is exercised by every person involved in our preservation world. When space, labor, and financial investments are figured into a potential acquisition, the curatorial process is already in full swing. All steps in the handling of a collection demand curatorial decisions involving different pairs of eyes, different perspectives, and different motives. And it continues when collections are prioritized, written about, and given public exposure. Whether an intern points out something extraordinary in the collection they are stabilizing, an archivist chooses samples to stream that reflect the character of a collection and its creator, or a programmer detects a new idiosyncratic context for a film. We're all part of the curatorial cycle. Nevertheless, the independents at times feel disconnected from the serious funding, disconnected from other larger institutions in the field, and disconnected from the conversation about best practices, about what indeed comprises important work. But as I understand it, this is the major reason for this symposium, to address how we can all work together better, to be more productive, strategic, and inclusive, not only in the content and amount of media we preserve, but also in the way we identify who these record keepers are and how our national system of record keepers preserves and interprets the materials we collect. And most essentially, quite honestly, how we assign the resources to do it. Chicago, like all major cities, has a complex system of universities, libraries, museums, and independent archives that deal with time-based media. I'm proud to say that in the last 10 years, several independent archives that handle audiovisual materials have struggled to find their legs and are now standing. And more than that, we're just beginning to understand how we can survive and hopefully thrive together not just in Chicago, but throughout a nationwide system of independent and regional archives. So why can't we begin erasing some of the lines that come between the independent archival organizations and the large institutions that teach and house special collections? Maybe go even further by devising a deliberate, systematic map of discovery and preservation that connects the various institutions, big and small, that connects and supports each effort towards preservation of our media legacies, that draws from the strengths of each and rises us, us all, and quite possibly where ownership of the materials is the least of our concerns. Maybe an intertwining workflow between larger humanities institutions 
and regional, hu regional humanities organizations can become a doable model. Funders might even incentivize both larger institutions and smaller institutions to collaborate with each other in discovery, processing, describing, and access, creating a system that would ensure productivity and expand the breadth of materials brought back to life. Most of what AV archives accomplish or produce is based upon hours and hours of skilled labor. There's no getting around that. Yet most regional archives and archival departments in large institutions are notoriously understaffed. A collaboration that currently works pretty well between universities and independent archives is the intern system, which directly addresses this labor issue. CFA's interns most often are university students, some either on their way to or from a preservation or library program. These students are almost always uncommonly bright and uncommonly motivated. CFA provides an enormous amount of training and hands-on experience that brings life and practicality to theory and best practices. In return, the interns make a substantial dent in the processing of and the exposure of our collections. They make a definitive difference to what we accomplish in our office. The NEH has in the past funded a few of these internships through a, a university fellowship grant. Why can't these granting opportunities be, maybe be expanded to smaller archives and other non-university organizations that train students in this work? Or why can't these types of grants just become routine? Paid inter internships can mean that these interns don't need to work another job, that they can devote more days of the week to the work at the archive resulting in more material being processed and uncovered. These increased hours might also change the nature of the collections interns can process in the time that they have. Every collecting archive has those lurking massive collections with elements, audio tracks, trims, B A and B rolls, the collection that will be extravagantly time consuming. The collection that is not quite sexy enough to merit an NEH or an NEA or a clear grant, but desperately needs one. These rich and complicated and often unprocessed collections could be assigned to the intern who can devote five days a week with total focus to that collection while picking up the more nuanced in depth and detailed aspects of the media. I know this works because project grants from local foundations have allowed CFA to pay 25 and even $50 an hour to masters and PhD students to research and write finding notes and film, film notes. Here's a synthesis of theory and practice, a collaboration between scholarship and execution that is superior and practical and meaningful in the humanities. It helps the future scholars and today's practitioners complete their degree and complete their projects in a relevant, holistic, and financially realistic way for everyone involved. Another shift in perspective when considering allocation of resources may involve responding to workflow productivity rather than the size of an institution or a budget. If indeed there is an urgency to identify and stabilize a rapidly deteriorating media reservoir in this country, the measurements of proven and successful productivity and access could be considered. Percentages of process and accessible AV materials with, within an institution may be a more useful gauge or met, metric of productivity. Another approach may be having separate grant offerings for academic institutions, libraries, museums, and independent archives. Instead of measuring all institutions from the same metric, should we create and work from a different, more targeted system that incorporates the strengths from each, instead of presenting a platform from which all compete with like metrics? Each does different things, their strengths are different, and at the same time, all our institutions in the long run inform each other. Why not acknowledge and commit to all in our haste to step up our pace to preserve our past? Another step in this direction might be this. 
what if some of the graduate programs in AV preservation offered classes that engender entrepreneurial skills, management, and public engagement? Classes geared towards regional archives as a career destination. Classes that offer techniques in working with and accessing the public that teach business skills. This most assuredly would be relevant to all organizations. Urge graduates in the field to think outside the box and go open a regional archive. We need them. We all know that there will always be more material out there than we together will ever be able to uncover keep safe, and make accessible. I personally feel that the prestige of ownership needs to be dissolved and transformed into something that resembles a heightened acknowledgement of the mechanics of action, exchange of thought, fluidity of discourse, the inclusion of voices between all types of institutions and their constituents. Resources tend to gravitate to the famous things, famous collections by famous media makers by nature can be dead end and dulled to death. There's so much undiscovered brilliance among us on the streets, in the crowds, in our communities. The amateur talent is not a notch below the professional talent. Its influence are different, that's all. Amateur work has been and currently is a working environment of choice, a mode of expression of choice, a chosen genre or type of communication. The recently discovered nanny photographer, Vivian Meyer, is not the only amateur out there for us to discover. She cannot be the only unknown buried amateur talent that has escaped us all until now. The odds are just too heavily stacked against that. There are more of her out there. Our field has to spread out, not contract, and maybe even re redefine what's important, which is something that seemed to be happening today. We're entering new times. I'm guessing we're moving towards a new and transformed 21st century model of preserving and exposing our time-based national treasures. I truly hope this conversation we've had today extends long into the future. Thanks. Hey, Nancy, would you like to take a few questions if there are any? That would anyone like to uh, pose a question for, for Nancy? Is there one? Oh, okay. Do we have the microphone? Go ahead. I'll have to repeat it. Um, and that, uh, yeah, people that that were worked had production companies and all. It, our parameters are Midwest. They're not all amateur or home movies. So we have um, some collections that are avant-garde artists. We have some documentary makers. Um, a lot of educational industrial films, which were professionally made. They were distributed, and then amateur. We have a close love for the amateur filmmaker. <laughs> Frustrated or jealous of your achievements and made life more difficult for collection development or has it been pretty harmonious? 
No, that's like, that's a cool question, actually. Um, I, to be quite honest, there are, um, there are other independent archives, and I think um, there has been a competitive feeling at, at some point, but that, honestly, I feel is dissolving, and we feel we need each other more than, um, than we need to beat each other. <laughs> and, um, and there's also real financial ways that we can help each other, and so um, that, actu that actually is coming into place, and it's really great. And, and unfortunately, some of those archivists aren't here today, but. 